Welcome to today's short video on how automation is a game changer for data governance. In this video, we'll explore how new data governance technologies are making data management easier. For those of you who don't know us, Thorogood is an independent global professional services firm specializing in data engineering, data science, and data visualization. As an organization, we're intent on combining our business focus with the best in class technology solutions to solve complex business problems. We offer a full range of services across the spectrum of data and analytics, including strategy and roadmaps, requirements, design, implementation, and training and support. And specifically for today, we'll be drawing on our experience putting together data governance strategies and solutions in place for our enterprise customers. As a quick introduction to myself, my name is James Leonard. I'm a principal data and analytics consultant with Thorogood. I've spent a lot of time working with our enterprise customers, designing their data platforms and implementing their data governance strategies and the tools that go along with that. In terms of the agenda for today's video, I'm gonna start off by talking about data governance and recapping some of the themes from a webcast my colleague Andrew Kennedy ran recently. I'll then talk about how the advances in technology are helping organizations get better at solving these challenges and ultimately helping organizations govern their data. And then at the end, I'll take a quick look at some of these tools as well. We're just starting off with a recap. When Andrew presented this, he spoke about these five key pillars to consider when we're managing our data. So everything from the regulatory compliance to the risks that we have to manage, to the governance processes, privacy and security requirements of our specific data sets. And what I'm going to do is focus on how tools help us manage the governance and privacy aspects specifically. And ultimately streamlining those aspects will make it much easier for us to manage compliance, reduce risk, and put the right security protocols in place for our data and specifically for the business use cases that we want to optimize. It's always important to remember why we're doing this. The consequences of not getting this right are high. So let's look at a few of the figures related to compliance. So according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, 71% of countries have data protection and data privacy legislation. For example, in the European Union, we have GDPR. And all of the frameworks globally have a common purpose but each has its specific requirements and guidance, creating complexity for global organizations when you're having to adhere to these different types of legislation. Then 49% of respondents to a MicroStrategy survey identified data privacy and security concerns as a barrier to more effective use of data and analytics. So it's important to help people in our organizations understand how best they can make use of data to realize the value from it. And then just as an example of the potential benefit, Gartner estimate the data and analytics leaders who share data externally generate three times more measurable economic benefit than those who don't. So you can see that while there are gonna be some real complexities in getting our data governance, compliance, privacy, security right, there's a lot of value that we can derive from it. But there's a lot that we need to do in our organizations to manage that data. And what I've done, is kind of listed out some of the key things that we need to think about as we get started in, on this journey. So first of all, we need to understand, well, what is the data that we have? What attributes does it contain? And what do those attributes mean? And that's ultimately the first step in, uh, in our data governance journey. When we know what data we have, we need to figure out what type of data is it? Is it something that we need to consider for GDPR because it contains personally identifiable information? Or if I'm trying to derive some more value from it for our organization, what type of data, what category of data is it? Is it finance data? Is it HR data? Is it sensitive finance data? And once we know what it is we're managing, what type of data it is, what classification it is, now I need to know where it comes from. Do I need to anonymize it at source? How can I go and rectify quality issues? Do I need to go and make that change in the source system? And once I've done that, I need a way to proactively manage it as well and a mechanism to help me identify, well, what are the things that I need to be looking at from a governance and compliance perspective? And that sounds pretty easy, right? But when you break it down, there are quite a lot of things that we do need to manage. And this diagram shows a historic version of the manual processes that we would have had to go through. So first of all, we need to initially catalog that estate. So being able to answer that question of what data do we have? Once we know what data we have, then we can start actively monitoring it and deriving the value from it. But it's not quite that simple. So cataloging the data estate on the left is simply the table stakes in terms of getting started with your data governance. It's really when you've got that in place that you can start focusing on the value add activity of managing the estate and working with the business to get the most out of that data. 
And really, what's the reality? And why have companies typically done this so badly in the past? Well, simply the matter of the fact is that cataloging the estate takes an awful lot of time. I remember creating data item registers in Excel with 10,000 rows, manually capturing the metadata associated with tables of data and actually the, the manual lineage as well. And then someone after we created that had to keep it up to date. And that's really what took most of the time of the data stewards rather than actually being able to focus on that value add to the right of the screen. And this is really why automation is such a game changer. So rather than data stewards having to manually maintain all this metadata, manually provide classifications, manually try and trace through data lineage, the latest data governance tools in the market remove a lot of this overhead. They allow us to automate the collection of data, provide rules to classify it, and automate the collection of that lineage. So ultimately, we reduce that cataloging overhead so we can effectively manage our data and reduce risk. And instead of being reactive to problems, we can be proactive and we can focus on providing value to the business. And two such tools are Databricks' Unity Catalog and Microsoft's Azure Purview, which are both data governance tools. Unity Catalog is a data governance solution really designed for all of our assets in the lake house, and especially when we're using Databricks to perform data transformation. Purview provides a governance portal that allows us to integrate data from different Azure and non-Azure sources, and we can configure it to automatically classify our data, scan different data sources, as well as provide insights to our data officers or data stewards to help them proactively manage that data. So what I wanted to do is go into a, a demonstration of the two tools. And for this demonstration, I'm going to use a lake house pattern that we see with a lot of our customers. In this instance, Databricks is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting, transforming the data. So transforming the data through those bronze, silver, gold layers or our medallion architecture. We will use Databricks Unity Catalog to capture the asset definitions and the lineage from those Databricks notebooks. And then alongside that, we're going to have Purview to act as our enterprise data catalog so we can search, we can classify data. And just to make this demo a little bit more fun, I've placed some sensitive data in our gold layer. But don't worry, it's only dummy data for the purposes of this demo. So what I wanted to first of all start off with was looking at Databricks. And what I'm just showing here is a Databricks notebook. And in this demonstration, we're looking at hotel reviews. So what I've got in that bronze layer is a number of different hotel reviews from different cities. So here we're just combining different hotel reviews from Beijing, Chicago, Dubai into one silver data set. And we're outputting that silver data set as a kind of conglomeration of all of the different hotel reviews. And then finally, we're doing some additional transformation on that silver table to create a gold layer. And here we're just looking at things like filtering the data. So we're looking at popular hotels. We're doing some additional concatenation so that we're creating the city country column which is essentially bringing together our city and country information. This is written in, in Python or, or PySpark code. And this is the kind of thing that our data stewards would have to go through to understand how the data is flowing between those 10 different source tables into that silver layer, and then the transformations that are taking place. So we would have been kind of manually inputting that into a spreadsheet as an example, manually capturing these flows. With Databricks' Unity Catalog, all of that is automated for us in the background. So if I go to my Data Explorer, this is really where we're able to see Unity Catalog coming into play. So I've been running this notebook in the development environment. I can see my bronze data sources, so I can see those 10 different cities, each with their individual hotel reviews, and I can see some of the information about it as well. So I've got my hotel name, I've got my metrics, like cleanliness, number of reviews as an example. Then that silver data set that we've created, so the hotel reviews, that consolidated view of all of the hotel information. And again, we see exactly the same kind of information. And then what we get in our gold layer, the, that popular hotel is where we've performed some filtering, we've applied some business logic to, to concatenate the country and the city together. And if I look at this, you can start seeing, I've started kind of using some of the functionality within Unity Catalog. So popular hotels, I've given the data set a definition. So popular hotels defined by the number of visits. 
I've started to give some descriptions on the column. So this is the city where the hotel is located, or this is the combination of the city and the country. I could see some more details behind this. So who created it, who last updated the table that helps me, you know, I can go back and speak to these individuals if I need to. I can apply permissions. So here I could go and grant permissions to individual users on this data set. I also get some auditability so I can see every single change that is applied to this table and by who as well. And then probably my favorite piece of functionality, something that historically has been very difficult to do, managing the lineage. And just remember this is automatically picked up every time I run a, a Databricks notebook. So I can see my lineage graph and I can see here that gold popular hotels is populated from the silver hotel reviews. If I hit this plus I can expand the lineage and I'll need to zoom out a little bit because we can see those 10 tables feeding in so I can see the, how the flow of data goes through. If I look at that city country column where I'm concatenating and applying some business logic, I make that selection, I can see that that comes from the city and country column within that. So I'm not having to manually go through the code, see what I'm concatenating together. Unity Catalog's doing that for me. And then if I wanted to see where city comes from, I can do that and I can trace it back to source. So instead of spending hours, days going through data transformation logic, tracing it back, these tools are giving us the ability to see those kind of insights. And if I want to start proactively managing it, as you can see this new icon kind of highlighted here, I can see who's using my data sets. I can speak to the users. I can see what they need from it. At the moment, it's just me running a couple of select star, maybe looking at the total number of review queries. But ultimately, you can see how this automation, I don't have to worry about defining the data sets. I don't have to worry about manually capturing the lineage. I can focus on who needs this data, how can I work with them, is the quality what I want it to be, which is a big difference to where we were manually populating data item registers. So that's just a quick introduction to Unity Catalog. What I'm now going to go into is Microsoft Purview, and Purview contains a bit of additional functionality. So what I'm showing on the screen here is the Purview data map. So essentially, I have the ability to catalog a lot of different sources within my estate. What I'm going to focus on is my data lake storage. So some organizations have massive data lakes or, or lake houses, and it would take hours to hours, days, weeks, months, years to catalog 10,000, 100,000 data sets. I don't have to worry about that with Purview. Purview automatically scans the data. So here I've got a pretty small data lake. It's got 73 discovered assets. And the way that we discover assets is by creating the scans. So this scan here will go through, it'll look at what's in my data lake, and it will automatically give me the metadata associated with it. But not only the metadata, I can start classifying my data as well. So if I open up the scan, what I've applied in this instance, if we just give it five seconds or so to test the connection. So here we can see I've just selected my purview marketing. I've selected a couple of folders that I want to, to scan. If I hit continue, we've applied a rule set and purview creates what are called classification rules. So Microsoft provide us with 208 different classification rules. So things like identifying PII information. So my Australia passport number, UK passport numbers and so on. We can also create our own custom rules. So I said I'd put some sensitive data in, it contains credit card information. I've created a custom rule to pick that up. So I hit okay, and this will automatically run through and classify our data. So if I just go to my catalog interface, which provides me a pretty feature rich search functionality to find my data, I could search for my sample PII information, or I can see that in my recently accessed items. As I look at this data set, I can see that that data set that I've uploaded contains both credit card numbers, but also US social security numbers. So without having to do anything, I've just applied some rules. It's able to classify my data for me. Like Unity Catalog, I get some properties so I can see where this data set is located. I can see the schema. I can see actually which column contains the personally identifiable information like my security, uh, social security number or my credit card number. Like Unity Catalog, I can see the lineage. So this is working with Data Factory to see how data is copied through the environment. I can see contacts, so I can contact Max to let him know that this contains 
credit card information, for example, but I can also see other related data sets. So it's pretty feature rich. As a, a data steward or a data governance lead, I want to see how well we're doing at categorizing and managing this data. And Purview also provides insights to my data estate. So I'm just going to look here at my development area. That's what I've been focusing on. And I can see 6% of my data within the development environment contains sensitive information. I haven't curated a lot of it, quite a lot of it doesn't have classification. So kind of seeing a highlight of what I need to go in and focus on. But if I click on that 6%, it will show me all of the data sets that contain that personally identifiable data. So I can see all classified data. So the city dimension contains world cities, surprisingly, or customers and employees contains people's names. So personally identifiable information. And all of this is automated. It's all done through those scans across our entire estate. So I'm not having to go through and look at the employee table to say it's got a person's name. I'm not having to assign business units. If I have a list of business units within my organization, we can assign those as classification rules and it will automatically assign data sets with this contains business unit. So you can see how that can be a, a real game changer in automating the, that left hand side, the cataloging where we used to spend maybe 90% of our time, we can actually move to the value add on the right and spend more of our time delivering value to the business, working with business unit users to get the most out of our data sets. But with that, I will conclude this short video and just say thank you for watching. Thank you.